very anxious. We're oh. <laughs> we are. <laughs> Here we go. Hi. How are you guys? Hello. Hello. How do we do this? I don't even know. I've never done crowdcast before. Really? Oh well. Okay. Yeah. So we're we're now live. Looks like there are 128 people watching us at this moment. Don't get nervous. <laughs> Um, we didn't actually have a chance to figure out what the run of show was going to be. We were, too, we were too busy dealing with the technical issues. So, like, how do you how do you want to run this down? You want to like go ahead right into the chat? Do you want to do a reading first? Do you want us if to only we, introduce I'm each sorry. other or ourselves? Uh, let's introduce. Let me first introduce you, N.K. Jemison. <laughs> Three time in a row, Hugo Award winning <laughs> author. Sorry, I still love. It. I was there. I was there for the third one. I still, sm I can still see us all leaping up. Anyway, very oh excited about that. Um, and my friend, who oh. is graciously agreed to do. Actually, you offered. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, I'm I enjoy having there. conversations with my friends. I, Go figure. I know. Yeah. In this strange time. Yeah. Of, whatever this strange time is. Yeah. Um, anyway, she's with me today and I'm Kate Elliott and I have a book that just came out today <laughs> called Unconquerable Sun, by the way. I was gonna say, you're you're not gonna leave it at that for fuck's sake, you're not. No, no. Um, also, no. I curse like a sailor, everybody, just FYI. Um, so this is Kate Elliott, who is my mentor in the, the epic fantasy writing world. Um, I introduced myself to her horribly uh, at a, a convention many years ago when I was a baby writer and I walked up to her and I said, I, I loved your books when I was, uh, I loved your Jaren novels when I was in high school and the look of horror that crossed your face <laughs> um, was, was sealed into my brain forever. Um, and you are the author of how many books? Jesus Christ, so many. This is my 27th novel. I mean, there's many who have written fewer years than me and published more. So, yeah, but your books are big. Your well, books I are know. And if you look, took Trader, Trader's Gate, for example, is a trilogy. Yeah. In one volume, so that would be three. That would like be an extra two. So if you did it, your by solo three, books are big. Yeah, that's what I mean. So it would be like if you added them all up, it would be more than twenty-seven. It'd be more like forty, probably, or forty-five. Oh. Or only, 500, I don't know. Yeah, all right. Only 40 bucks. Yeah. Oh, well. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and uh, I have also told you this story, but uh, someone did that to me at a convention not too long ago um, and, and came up to me and was like, I loved your books when I first started reading them as a kid. This is a grown ass woman. And I had a moment of this is karmic payback. Yep. This is, this yep. is, yes. So um, see, I, I did that to a writer. <laughs> really? Yes, so it, was it was actually it was Robert circle Silver of like it was Robert Silverberg embarrassment. <laughs> it was Robert Silverberg, and I told him, but I said I read your first novel when I was in fourth grade. Oh, fuck, I mean, you know, honestly, I don't really mind, but you oh, know, but still, I'm sorry. No, no, but, <laughs> but yeah, haven't I told me... you this story about this? So then, no, you never told me that one. So yeah, so so he he got the look right. We all we know the look now, um, and then many years later. Mm -hmm. I saw him in a 2010 Melbourne World Con. I saw him and I went up to him and said, hey, hey, do you remember me? And he goes, I remember you. you oh, know. shit. Really? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He remembered. <laughs> he remembered. And I said, I just want you to know mm -hmm. that I have a new book coming out. So in 2010, that would have been Cold Magic. I, said, I have a new book coming out. And my editor for this book started reading me in high school. Yeah. That was great. It was great. It's, it's hard getting old. Fuck that shit. I hate that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well. well, yeah. Anyway. All right. So we're we are two fantasy writers who are struggling along in this in the the decrepitude of our ancient old dead lives. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it is good to see you. I have not seen you, you, laid eyes on you since the last time you came through New York. What was that, like last year? Was it last year or the year before? 
It was November last year. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. I remember Magpie was grown because you picked him up at one point and I was like, be careful. He's heavy. Um, but, um, he loves me. He loves me. He so. really does. But I have an adorable picture of, of him and you oh. and, and yeah. he's just like this giant chunk of a cat. So, it's, oh my gosh. It's because he behaves like a dog. I could play with him kind of like a dog. He does. He does. Yeah. And uh, if Finn shows up in this this stream, I'm sure people would love to see the adorable Finn. So, I told my son to bring him up at 4:45 because he's been very barky and like demanding. Mm, um, okay. And he's probably he would just sit here and bark at me for half an hour. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In a nice right. way. In a nice way. Finn's a very nice dog. But oh dear. Okay. Well, but yeah. I mean, you know, he's endurable, nice, noisy he's a dog. Um, yeah. Well, I have fed Ozzy and Magpie in hopes that they will not interrupt me, um, and they are now in a food coma up in the front room. Um, so. Generally, Ozzy is not so bad. He just, you know, jumps up onto the thing behind me and sort of walks around and glares at me like, why aren't you petting me? Um, but Magpie will jump up and knock over the laptop and meow very loudly and all of that. So, yeah. All right. Well, but we're here to talk about your book, Unconquerable Sun. Um, do you want to start off with a reading or how do you want to do this? Well, I wasn't going to, but since you suggested it, I, <laughs> I will. I will, because I'm very obedient, and we can talk later about the reason that I wrote the only true smut I've ever written in my life is because of you. Really? Yeah, okay, we can talk about that later. I have not read Unconquerable Sun yet. I this mean, is not in Unconquerable to... Sun. This is from Spirit Walker. Oh, oh, no, oh, that was good smut, though. That I was well, going to yeah, say. I only That's wrote it because of you. What? Really? You read Cold Fire. I think you beta read Cold Fire, and then you yeah. said, you can't leave they us there. Fuck. Yeah, yeah you gotta have it. And I said, but my character would never say she will. She won't tell you that. And then out of, but then you, yeah. So then I wrote the ex, the bonus chapter. Thank you. Because of you, you're welcome. I mean, this seems obvious to me, but okay. Um, so I am happy to contribute would, to your debauchery, uh, yes, your literary so debauchery. Thank you, or you're welcome. I don't know which. I was gonna say when you said my first smut, I'm like, that's not your first smut. Okay, no, well, my first smut. Yeah. Ah, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I am happy to be a partner in crime when it comes to things like that. Well, <laughs> People in the chat approve well, too. I know they're yeah they're. It was good. It was good. Somebody right. <laughs> <laughs> and it was for them. It was very good. It was it really good. Was. Um, okay. Enough of that smut. There's no smut in this. I'm sorry to tell you. There are further books in the series though, aren't there? Oh, there are. And there will so be. So there's still time. There's still time. Okay, so I did an Instagram Live last week where I read two different, two different excerpts. So I'm not gonna read either of those today in case anyone is here who heard that. I'm gonna uh, mute myself and vanish my camera while you read. Okay. And this will take about seven minutes, just okay. so you know. Okay, so this section is called A Dispatch from the Enemy because it's important to have a full point of view about everyone involved in this very large, epic story. The character I'm writing about is named Apama. And I think everything else is, is self-explanatory. The main room of the quarterdeck's service lounge was silent and dim, except for a figure seated at the welcome desk reading a book. When the soldier did not look up, Apama gave a cough. <coughs> the soldier startled. Jusme, what in the saints forgiven hells are you doing sneaking in like, <gasps> oh, sorry, Lieutenant. They leaped to their feet and saluted unnecessarily. I'm reporting in. Here's my script. We don't get transfers down here. And yet, here I am. The soldier, a specialist by rank, reluctantly accepted the script and slotted it into the security cube with their lower right hand. This place seems quiet, Apama said, just to say something. It usually is, remarked the specialist in a morose tone, gaze flicking th toward the doors through which Apama had so untimely entered. I usually get a lot of studying done. 
hoping to make senior specialists this go round. They waited in awkward silence until the specialist frowned, opened a virtual keyboard and tapped into it. No orders in our queue for you, Lieutenant. There's no orders for me? No, transfers always go straight to the station. This post is for local liaison and cargo routings. Are you sure you're at the right place? She wasn't sure at all. Nothing made sense to her about the cursory nature of the orders or the way they'd been sprung on her after she'd thought she was headed to a ship squadron like everyone else in her cohort. It had been arbitrary and sudden. The doors whisked aside. A person hustled in wearing the insignia of a lieutenant senior grade, the swagger of a Lancer pilot, and the welcoming smile of a jolly, happy soul. Hey, you must be Apama Atsabao. Sorry I'm late. Meant to be here before, but I got hung up running errands. Saints alive, have you ever tried to buy malted barley in a slack-jawed town like this one? He halted in front of Apama and stuck out his lower right hand. I'm Abigail Kakanadu, adjutant to Strike Squadron Leader Commander Ir Charpentier, who you'll come to know by her call sign, Nails. Sorry I'm late. Oh, wait, I said that already. Come with me, Lieutenant. Apama grabbed her kit bag and followed him out. Kakanadu trotted instead of walked, so Apama trotted alongside, kit bag thumping on her back. There's a gunship waiting for us. You can call me Gale, by the way. Gale Force is my call sign because I talk a lot. And never mind. Here we are. They passed into the support zone for a landing pad where a gunship sat in vertical lift position. The mighty rim of the gas giant ar around which the moon orbited was nudging up over the horizon. An astonishing sight. Apama had no leisure to savor. A senior chief gestured impatiently. Move! Our lift window is closing. They pounded up the ramp. Gunships weren't troop transports, and yet a bewildering number of passengers and crew were crammed on board. Apama got split away from her companion and stuck on a bench between the fragrant sack of malt and a rather handsome young Gatoy auxiliary. Even having only two arms, he had a lean, powerful symmetry and grace of form. The striking appeal of his facial features was emphasized by the almost indiscernible pattern gleaming beneath his skin. When he caught her checking him out, he blushed and turned toward the Gatoy sitting on his other side. He spoke in a language she could not understand, and the other Gatoy glanced at her and laughed. A moment's scrutiny of the hold counted 11 of the savage fighters who were generally assigned out in 11-person units called an arrow. After what the technician had told her, it seemed rude and also dangerous to try to talk to any of them, much less attempt to examine the fascinating neural patterns all Gatoy had, so she didn't. Lieutenant Kakanadu was strapped in across the hold next to the senior chief, the two chatting up a storm as if they were old acquaintances. For Apama, the sack of malt and the auxiliary were equally silent companions as the gunship launched for its five hour journey to the orbital station. She popped in earplugs and dozed, thankful to be headed at long last for her final destination. It therefore came as an unpleasant surprise that instead of being ushered off the docking ring to the station's quarter deck to start intake proceedings, she and the sack were hustled to a different dock and onto a utility shuttle. Her companion shifted the heavy sack into the arms of a senior specialist. I got everything we can launch, Gail announced. The pilot and co-pilot turned to give Apama a slow once over. The pilot drawled, you're the whole reason we've been sitting on our asses at anchor for three days waiting to leave? I'm transferring in for duty, she said, glancing at Gail for help. We are full up on utility pilots, remarked the co-pilot, lips curling. So I don't know where you think you're headed, and you don't look one bit like a AAA fast track heritage seed, do you? In fact, are you a, I said we can go now, Gail broke in, and you know who gave me my orders. Nails gave the order, yes, we know. This shell is a Lancer pilot? The pilot asked with a sneering curl of the lips. I earned my place through hard work and high, high scores, just as you did, Apama said in a coolly neutral tone. 
Gail said, nah, his scores weren't that good, which is why he's a utility pilot and not a Lancer like us, Apama. I can call you Apama, right? Gail turned his back on the sour-faced pilots and headed for the passenger benches set against a bulkhead away from the cockpit. Come sit by me. There'll be a good view out of the porthole. They strapped in side by side. The senior specialist stowed the sack in a locker, gave Apama a cursory nod of acknowledgement and exited into the cargo hold. A comforting exchange with station control tower initiated. The shuttle disengaged, withdrew from the station and slotted into a departure lane. Once clear, the shuttle accelerated around the magnificent curve of the striped gas giant, soon leaving the station and the planet-sized moon behind. Gale talked the whole time, for which Apama was grateful as it became clear he was flooding the silence on purpose. So it was that Gale was telling a long story in a deliberately comic fashion about how he had crashed his first Lancer into a Shiver Peak wilderness and spent a month hiking to safety with a broken arm and the lover he had just had a nasty breakup with when Apama saw the fleet. The ships in their tight, ready formation were tucked behind a rare triple confluence of three of the gas giant's moons. There were hundreds. The assault cruisers that were the backbone of the fleet, Yele-style heavy frigates, light cruisers on the wings, and an astounding ten dreadnoughts, the jewels of the fleet. What are all these doing here? She asked, shocked into speech. There's nowhere to go from here except into the void. We are all destined for death, said Gail cheerfully. The pilot hailed one of the dreadnoughts. Bravo, Charlie, six, seven. This is six, seven, unicorn three on your nine, two, nine, or four, mark eight, four, six, one. Checking in with a full tank of mass and five souls on board. Six, seven, unicorn three. Copy your contact on my nine, two, nine, or four, mark eight, four, six, one with five souls and a full tank. We've got you cleared for hangar five. You're clear to kick to tower. Welcome back. You're the last ones in. The last ones for what? Where are we going with this boss fleet? That's the question we're all asking, isn't it? Gail replied. We don't know. Okay, so you have officially hooked the hell out of me with this. Um, and, and I will be reading it ASAP. So thank you. So I, I had so many questions as a result of that, like very short excerpt. Um, do you want to talk about it first? Or do you do want, do you want me to like, just kind of shoot with my questions? Just go with the questions. All right, that works. Uh, well, first of all, the world building is exciting as hell and interesting to me. Um, but the biggest question that I have as a fellow fantasy writer is, why did you decide to go space opera? Um, I wanted to do Alexander the Great. In and actually, space. In space. And, but I wanted to do Alexander the Great. Why wouldn't you do Alexander the Great in space, right? <laughs> That's in all the space. answer that we need. Right. Anyone can do, I mean, anyone can and should do a historical novel of Alexander the Great, mm -hmm. or whether or not gender swapped, mm -hmm. or a fantasy novel. But space is just, it, it was extra. And I, I don't know why. It just, why wouldn't you? <laughs> there are people who believe that fantasy writers, for whatever reason, can't do science fiction and vice versa. Um, yeah, I don't get it either. Um, but... No, no. Nora, aren't they the same? <laughs> You're gonna get so much hate mail because of this. Okay, you 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 can't say things like that in front of certain people. Yes, well, I know, but but they're all under the umbrella. This is my umbrella. Um, they're all under the umbrella of yeah. the literature of the fantastic speculative fiction. It's the same yeah. technique. Yeah, seems that way to me too. Uh, science fiction, science and speculation. 
fantasy horror interstitial stuff i've never seen the the simple genre boundaries as something that was enough to actually stop people but you know i remember when i did the uh, mass effect uh tie-in book i did a few years ago um i got a bunch of people saying you know nk jemison wrote space opera i'm like i i play mass effect guys with the why do you uh, it doesn't make sense to me but whatever um, well i think that remember we always have to ask ourselves who does it benefit for creating these divisions? And who is asking these questions and why yeah. do they defend yeah. those genre boundaries so firmly? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, now the world building that you've already put into this in just that very brief segment has hooked the living hell out of me. Neural patterns, What what is that about? I wanna know. I can't tell you. Um. Because it would be a spoiler and you don't even find out and help later. <sighs> Fine. All right. Okay. Um, you've clearly got multiple species or races of people, rather not species, but races of people in this in this setup, like uh, the in a lot of ways, like the actual Alexander the Great's empire of old. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, can you can you maybe give us a summary of the parallels, if that makes sense? Like, who are the Macedonians in this? Who are the would that be spoilers? No, 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 no. Because okay. I think the the big three are are obvious. Um, the Republic of Caonia mm -hmm. is Macedon. Mm -hmm. um, that's where Princess Sun is from. That's where her mother Irene is, Queen Marshall. Mm -hmm. The Fiend Empire, and that's spelled P H E N E, which mm -hmm. matters. I'm not going to tell you why, because I want people to have to enjoy entering the story and seeing what connections they can make. And it's not just to the history, but it's to other things too. The Fiend Empire is the Persia analog and the Yele League, Y-E-L-E, -E, um, is kind of the Athenian Greek city-state analog. Um, and you know that because uh, I don't know where, I, I don't have it to hand, which I should have had, but mm -hmm. Irene at one point says about the Yele, who are the Athenians said, they just can't stop talking. They're so in love with their own voices and how important they are. So that was my little <laughs> historical job. So uh -huh. those, are, those are the big three. And then there's others who don't specifically fit analogs, but fit the idea that it was a rich, a richly populated area with a lot of different groups of people. Mm, okay. And you know, you can't, and. As, as we know, you can't write anything as complicated as the real world. Mm, it's mm. people can't parse all that. You have to kind of strip it down a little bit. Mm, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, I do also, I see someone in the chat says, now I feel like I need to read up on Alexander the Great before I can read this. I kind mm -hmm. of feel like that too. Um, you don't, but, but you don't. It's written so that you could know nothing about Alexander the Great. It's just the template I used mm -hmm. because I had things I wanted to do with it. And I wanted to write a woman, and it's actually not just son, it's also um, her mother, Irene, mm. who, who there's never any question that they can lead. No mm. one ever, there's none of this I had to fight to prove myself, it's just assumed that they're competent mm -hmm. and that they can lead. And I wanted to write that story. Um, so that okay. allowed, me, allowed me to do it, yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, it sounds interesting as hell. Um, like I said, I am super, super excited about this. When does it come out? Today. Oh, shit. <laughs> I didn't realize. Um, I saw some right. chat mention October, so I'm reading the chat oh, quickly. That must be um, in, in Australia. UK. The oh, United the UK. Kingdom and Commonwealth. Oh, such and, a delay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Oh. Well, they picked it up late. Or, oh, yeah. Okay. It's a different... It's, the publisher in the UK and Commonwealth is head of Zeus. Huh, okay. So yeah, that's why there's the delay. And I'm sorry, UK and Commonwealth, Australia, mm -hmm. New Zealand people, but mm -hmm. Avoid spoilers, stay off, like don't ask about this on Twitter. Watch out for spoilers. All right, um, so that sounds interesting as hell. Um, I have a lot of questions about Apama, but I'm, I suspect the answer is going to be read the fucking book. So, so I will have to just simply make sure that I do that. Ask, um, ask one. 
ask, I just want to, I want to hear, this is interesting because I, she's a really important character, although she's a minor character in book one. Mm. So, so ask me one, I just want to see what you picked up in that section. So I have a number of questions. I noticed that she was paying a lot of attention to the savage, which is a very Macedonian way of thinking about other people. I, I picked up on that, but um, I noticed. Hmm? Oh, she's not Macedonian. Oh, she, she's Cal from the, Cal she's, she's from the Fiend Empire. Oh, yeah. Ooh, sorry, sorry, I didn't make that clear. At the hmm. beginning, she's from the Fiend Empire. That's why it's a dispatch from the enemy. She's the mm -hmm. enemy of the mass of Kaonia. Interesting. So all of her chapters are headed dispatch from the enemy. So we get huh. a little glimpse into what's going on with oh. them. Okay. See, now I just want to know more about the world, but the answer is going to be read the damn book. So, I'm, all right. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. That's fine. But I'm That's sorry. Fine. Um, another question I had is famously Alexander the Great. Uh, had a male lover that he preferred over the wife that he was basically required to have and so forth. And my, my understanding of Alexander the Great is shaped as much by popular culture as it is by history. So I could be wrong on this. Um, but so is that uh, the case in Apama's case? Oh, not or, or Son, son, son is the Alexander the Great analog. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. So it is a little confusing to read this Apama chapter, which mm -hmm. I like. I'm going to mm -hmm. confess to you. The, mm -hmm. Well, I like this chapter in general because mm -hmm. um, I like the Fiend Empire because they're different from the Kaonian Empire. I mean, the Kaonian is not an empire. <gasps> yeah. Um, but I have to admit, I like reading this because of the communications thing at the end, the Bravo Charlie 6 7. Which my son, who, my son uh -huh. does that stuff in the Navy. Oh, really? So I wondered if he helped you with that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's, so he, that's why it sounds good. <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't say adorable. I've met your son. He's yeah, yeah, yeah. a grown ass man. But, yeah, um, yeah. He's, he's but, not yeah. adorable. I, please don't make him feel bad about that. But, um, but that is adorable. A son helping his mom with the military lingo. With that's the cool. military lingo and making it feel like oh, nice. that lingo. But to answer your other question, mm -hmm. one of the most interesting things when you look at the like the Macedonian upper class of its time. So mm -hmm. if you look at Alexander and Philip, his father, mm -hmm. and to remind and, and just to remind people who don't know this, our way of viewing sexuality you know, the, the, like the words homosexual and heterosexual, they come from the 19th century. They're not how people, I'm not a scholar of sexuality, but they're not how people in the Middle Ages or in the ancient world defined themselves, defined their sexuality, defined their gender. So just with that said, um, I will say that the court of Macedonia was already queer. Philip, everyone knew Philip had relations with both women and men. That was just how it was. It wasn't even considered a big deal at that time. The, I, I think the biggest issue with, well, I don't know, I'm not a scholar of Macedonia, I'm not a scholar of the court of Alexander, but part of the issue with Hephaestion was that he was so close to him, so he could be seen to have too much influence, if you see mm -hmm. what I mean, and that's not mm -hmm. good. You mm -hmm. know, the women, a wife had a different, she had a very specific, social role so her her influence could be controlled in that sense mm. if that makes sense mm -hmm. you know and it's a patriarchal world too mm -hmm. so to answer your question there's there's only really four characters who are well there's more than four characters but there's only four characters who i will tell you straight out are mm -hmm. direct analogs there's son who's alexander the great mm -hmm. irene her mother who's philip mm -hmm. son's father joa who mm -hmm. is the Olympias analog, who's Alexander's mother. And then the Hephaestian analog is Hestia or Hetty, and she is a woman. And mm -hmm. so, yes, there is, yeah, so I kept that. Okay, all right. I, I, I felt it was important. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, I was introduced to Alexander the Great's fictional legacy, I guess, or, or uh, historical fiction legacy through um, Mary, 
Renault. I'm forgetting her name. Thank you. Okay. Everybody knows this woman's name and I yeah. keep forgetting her name for some reason. Um, through her books, um, which I read ages ago. Um, and okay. so, you know, there's a certain romanticization that happens uh, in, in that depiction. Um, and like I said, I don't know as much about uh, Macedonian history as I do about Macedonian historical fiction based on that. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, I don't know where the, the line between what's real and what's not uh, falls in. I did know about the, the cultural sort of differences between um, Greek societies or Greek adjacent societies and the way that we define sexuality in our very period, post Puritan, uh, I don't even know what to call it, homophobic way. Um, so, you know, that was just something that I was curious about. All right. Um, so what was the most challenging or, or what was the most, I guess, I was going to say challenging scene to write, but what I really want to know is what was the most challenging history um, that you decided to incorporate? And, and you don't have to tell me how you did, but was, what was the most interesting historical fact that you decided to basically analog into the book, if that makes sense? Well... I gotta think about fact. I'm not sure I can come up with that in a minute, but I think the hardest thing to do is to turn a battle into a space battle. Because okay. space battles, you have all that time. I mean, it's not that on a land battle in a big battlefield like Granicus, which was the first of the major battles Alexander and his army fought in the Persian empire, which actually was in Anatolia, which is now mm. Turkey. But mm. um. And of course you have people moving back and forth and it takes time for people to get places. But on a space battle, you have so much distance, so much communication dilation that it's harder. You can't create a direct analog. You have to create it to be something different. Although um, you so could go with space opera magic. I'm sorry. You um, could. You could technology um like you know ansible type communication that's instantaneous uh instantaneous space travel sounds in space no but you could fudge it if you want well i am a great believer that if you're gonna have these long distances you mm -hmm. don't want to spend your whole book saying it took them 10 years to fly to the next i mean to to take their their fleet to the next solar system. Mm -hmm. So I do cheat with what <laughs> I would say is magic, but mm -hmm. which I pretend- But we're not allowed perfect. to say that. We're not allowed to say that. Um, <sighs> There's no so, magic in science fiction. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's what we call it, space opera. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course, of course. All right. Um, I see that we've got uh, just only three questions so far. Come on, guys, we need more questions in this. Um, so uh, I was going to segue into questions at this point, but let's keep asking uh, each other questions about the book then. That might work a little better. Or what would you prefer? Um, I, I wanna know quickly, as we move away from the book briefly, and you don't have to answer this. How are you negotiating writing in this strange time? Oh, shit. Uh, I thought people might find that of interest in general. Yeah, I, I guess I probably should have gone there, but it's also sort of like a little bit of a sore spot for me and not in a bad way. Um, I've been struggling. Um, you know, yeah. this is the, the pandemic um, in theory, at least should have been a great time to, <laughs> excuse me, to write because enforced isolation, um, nothing else to do, couldn't go to brunch, couldn't, you know, go hang out with friends or anything like that. Um, in theory, that should have been a good time to write. But when you're watching your country slowly fuck up its response to a global pandemic, uh, and when you're plagued constantly with fucking fireworks every minute. I'm sorry, we're, we're having the fireworks problem still. Yeah, I've heard about um, that. Yeah, it, like the weekend, I, I hoped that the weekend would finally kind of end it, but we're still getting a few. Um, but that said, um, so, you know, when you're, when you're slowly watching thousands of people suffer and die needlessly because you have completely inadequate, incompetent leadership uh, on a federal level, um, and and you open Twitter and the rage 
sort of washes over you and the despair begins to encroach upon you, it's hard to think of other worlds. Um, especially in the case of the, the series that I'm writing right now, which is the, the Great Cities trilogy, which I had intended to be more lighthearted than the Broken Earth series, but fucking pandemic. And, you know, and, oh, and, oh, yeah. and yeah. you know, yet another iteration of police brutality and yet another iteration of, you know, this country defending its tendency to not do uh, write by all of its citizens. And, you know, it's it's hard to write in that kind of environment. It's especially hard to write something that's supposed to be lighthearted. Um, now, granted, my version of lighthearted tends not to be, but I mean, for me, it is. Um, I mean, you know, said that, so I didn't have to. So. Yeah, I mean, like, there's only a little yeah. potential apocalypse in the in my book. It's, you know, it's not that much. But it's well dressed. Uh, it's a well dressed apocalypse. Thank you. Um, so yeah, it's it's been hard, um, but you know, I'm I'm slowly. What I've had to do is do things like ration Twitter. Um, I now hop on Twitter for about an hour early in the day, and then I quit. Um, and then I don't know what's going on. Um, and I hate that I feel out of the loop on so many things, especially stuff that's happening in the industry, because we've also had a resurgence of uh, sexual harassment and assault issues and all kinds of horrible shit happening. Now in both the science fiction and fantasy field and the comics field, everything is going nuts at the same fucking time. I hate not being on top of everything that's happening, but that is what I have had to do. I have had to disengage. So, yeah. um, and it is the only way that I can kind of allow uh, my creative self to process some of what I've experienced. Are you having issues writing oh, right now? Yeah, oh yeah. Okay, I, um, so. I remember last year thinking to myself, oh, I'm so stressed out. You know, some of those mm -hmm. reasons are not, not I'm gonna talk, not gonna talk about them now, but, yeah. but, um, and I thought, oh, if only I could go to a cabin in the woods for four months and not have contact with anybody, <laughs> wouldn't that be great? It should be totally isolated. And now and I'm like, somewhere well, a monkey's okay. paw curls. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm like, did I do this? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, but it, it's because some days I'm like, I'm good, right? And then other days it's just this. It, yeah. You know what? It, to me, it feels like a cytokine storm. Right? They talk about mm, the COVID, yeah. the disease yeah. having that, the whole body goes, it's like the body politic is having this cytokine storm all over, and we're all having this ebb and flow from it. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know. Mm. It's, a, it's a tough time. Well, I mean, yeah. it's always been a tough time, hasn't it? But yeah, yeah. It, I mean, at the end of the day, um, we have been through things as bad or worse. Uh, as a species. Um, yeah. And whether our country survives or not, uh, I fully believe that human beings will survive. Um, but I have doubts about the country. Countries are not immortal. Um, and this one seems to be doing a pretty good job of shooting itself in various body parts. Um, and, you know, we'll see what happens, I suppose. Uh, these, these uncertain times. Well, when that's was, a depressing fucking note, though. I was just, can I just add one thing? When I was 16, oh, sure, sure. I, mm -hmm. when I was 16, I wrote a paper for mm -hmm. my American history class comparing, directly comparing the Roman Empire and the American Empire. And I mm -hmm. described how the American Empire was going to fall. And mm -hmm. I feel like that is why, I mean, maybe I was, but obviously I was already a budding science fiction writer. You so. and that monkey's paw. All right. I know. I'm sorry. So, yeah, you got to stop it. You got to stop. Yeah. It's your fault. It's your yeah. fault. No. J'accuse. No. <laughs> Okay, now we both okay. need therapy. Yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, well, I was already there, so. <laughs> you oh, and me oh, both. wait, hold on, hold on. Finn? Oh, we've, Finn, got, we've got Finn signed. Finn, Finn, come here. Oh, he's not coming. Finn. No. He's looking at me. Come here. I'll be right back. Okay. Oh, my God, you're leaving to get the dog. <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, it's just me, folks. So, ah! Ah, it's so cute! Oh my gosh, he's the cutest dog. So he's really dirty because he's going to the groomer tomorrow. So there was no point in washing him today. Mm -hmm. And you say it's hi to adorable. everyone. 
Hey Finn, Finny Finn. He can't. 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 Yes. Okay. Oh, he's the cutest damn thing. He's uh, okay. so sweet. He's so sweet. I was afraid that time was going to get away from us, and it's starting to. Uh, okay. All right. We have I'm twenty ready. minutes left. Do you want to segue into questions? Let's do questions. All so right. People can have those. All right. Um, so, do you want me to ask the question, or do you want to read them out yourself, oh. or how do you want to do this? Um, in the ask a question area down at the bottom. Um, I don't think I have the ability to highlight the questions being answered or anything like that. Um, we've got some back end folks who may be able to help us with that. Um, but notice folks, for those of you that are looking at the ask a question area, you can upvote questions um, based on you know whatever you find interesting. So uh, if you wanna apply your upvotes that will help us figure out an order in which we may wanna answer them. Um, the ones that are more upvoted uh, tend to be the ones that everybody wants to hear the answer to. Um, so maybe maybe I can read them and then you answer them. You want to do it that way? Okay, okay sure. All right, okay. Uh, let me open up, ask a question, first of all. Uh, oh, oh, shit, upvotes are coming in by the second. All right, uh -oh. so uh, there's one, though, that seems to have risen to the top uh, by Lauren A. Would either of you consider taking a similar approach uh, transposed fantastical setting historical fiction to another historical figure or period, and if so, when slash who? Well, I mean, do you want to take that one first? Okay, I need to finish this one first. All right. Um, that's my answer, so I, I need a while. And I'm the one that hasn't done that, so I kind of feel yeah. like I, I yeah. should answer that question. The problem is, though, there's so many interesting historical periods. Um, I will say... Uh, I don't know how much I can safely talk about this. Um, I have started a possible collaborative project um, with another friend of mine, Mickey Kendall, that is somewhat historical, um, set in the 1920s. Um, well, it's kind of ranging from antebellum, uh, kind of ranging from, uh, sorry, postbellum. Uh, I always get those wrong. Uh, ranging from roughly 1860 to the 1920s. Um, and we're gonna range across the Harlem Renaissance. There will be uh, there will be time travel involved and yeah. so forth. Uh, it is literally just brainstorming at this point. We're working on a synopsis and scripts. Uh, that's all I can say. Um, okay. So. Uh, I, I, I said too much. Um, anyway, uh, so let's move on. Next question. All right. Uh, so. I'm fanning yes. myself. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, that that would be the period that I I find the Harlem Renaissance fascinating. Um, fascinating. The the politics of it, the the shadow that it hung under, um, the the horrible time that preceded it, which uh, is known as the Redemption Period in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically kind of what we're going through right now to some degree. Um, so I find that fascinating, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. All right, so next question that seems to be upvoted is uh, from Rebecca Kim Wells. Uh, what books are you excited about, slash, uh, uh, parentheses, read recently slash upcoming re releases? Um, oh, I'm so bad at this one. Um, um, I can start if you want. Start, start, start. Okay. Uh, I most recently have been reading um, P. Jelly Clark's uh, Ring Shout, um, which I love so far, but I'm not quite done with it. I'm, I'm reading really slowly these days. Um, I am friends with Martha Wells, and she sent me the latest murder bot book. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's so good already. Um, Does but she like I you better than she likes me? <laughs> Possibly. Oh my God. I mean, I did ask. 
So that helps. Oh, oh, but, that, okay. <laughs> all right, all right. But, I know. But I don't. But okay, like I don't know that she's ready to like share that with people. It's okay. It, it's all right. All right. All right. Just saying. Oh, um, so anyway, um, so I'm super excited about that. But it will be a while before these books come out. Um, and I most recently, uh, the sort of newest book that I most recently read that is out. Well, that's not helpful. I've been doing nothing but research books lately. All right. Well, um, I'm reading a bunch of stuff that isn't out yet, so I'm excited about that. Oh, hey, someone put the ring shot link in. Oh, uh, nice. Fantastic. All right. Uh, interactivity. Wave of the future. Um, now okay, are you so ready to answer that? Yeah, yeah, I am now. So I will briefly talk about three books that I beta read, hmm. which won't be out until next year. One okay. is a novella called Fireheart Targer by Aliette de Badard, which is coming out from Tor.com in January, February next year. It's um, set in a fantasy, uh, I'm so bad at this, uh, but it's a fantasy like 18th century Vietnam and its relationships with outside places and mm. uh, the political maneuverings. Mm -hmm. um, I love I her also, work, it's so lyrical. Uh, I haven't she, read this one, but yeah. Well, she uses detail in a way that just blows me away to like a detail can can tell you a, a detail that's this big can tell you this much if mm -hmm. it's if it's deployed right. Mm -hmm. um, I also read Zen Cho's novel, which has a working title of Blackwater Sister, which is mm -hmm. set in present day Malaysia about mm -hmm. a young woman who was raised in the US by her Malaysian parents and they have to go back to Malaysia and what happens and there's ghosts mm -hmm. and trouble. Mm -hmm. um, her grandmother is speaking to her. her, her dead grandmother's talking to her and has stuff that she needs her to do. It's so good. And you said and this is Zen Cho? Cool, all right. Zen Cho, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, Zen has this ability to blend humor with mm -hmm. like really serious stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And then, Tade Thompson's mm. also coming out next year with the working title of Ragtime Nightmare, which is SF thriller set in space. Uh, it's basically a locked room mystery, um, mm -hmm. but a thriller mm -hmm. and it's, it's so good, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I also forgot that one of the books, I mean, it's not super recent for me because uh, published authors, as you guys have now seen, uh, we get, books way ahead of the time that the public gets to see them. Um, they don't feel recent to me, even though they really are. Um, but I did read a while back, Alia Don Johnson's Trouble of the Saints, which I believe is coming out actually this month. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and it's fantastic. Um, it's like jazz assassins, like I, I can't even really describe it. Um, it's 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 like it's deeper than that. Um, that's a terrible terrible way to boil that down. Um, but it's beautifully written. Uh, it is an excellent period piece. It is powerful as fuck. Um, highly recommended. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Let's get back to questions now. Um, the next one that I see that's got enough got a lot of votes is uh, from Amanda. A uh, general craft question for both of you. Do you have only one story slash project at a time or do you find yourself juggle juggling a lot of ideas slash projects at once? And if so, how do you work on all of them or do you? You wanna do that one? So at the beginning of my process, I might be doing a bunch of things at once. But when I get probably about halfway through a book, I have to just focus on it until it's done. Mm -hmm. um, to, to get all the way through to the end. But it is also true I have like little side chicks, side lines. <laughs> I don't know, whatever. <sighs> because sometimes your brain just needs a break. Yeah. So, yeah. Creative so I'm always chicks. working. There's always something <laughs> else going on over there. I love it. Creative side chicks. That's the, that's the new term now. All right. Um, for myself, I cannot do more than one novel at a time. Um, I, in fact, uh, tend to develop novel ideas halfway through the novels that I'm already working on. And then I just have to kind of put the, the cool new one on the back burner. And of course, it continues to distract me throughout the rest of the book that I know I need to do. Um, but that's because that's how my brain works. Whenever it's got work that it knows that it needs to do, it immediately throws up a distraction and is like, wait, look, look what's that over there? And, and 
so that's that's my creative, uh, my my brain's reaction to stress is that you know it comes with a new book. I know who these are. These are Jolene's, right? Jolene, <laughs> Jolene. Oh, no. That's what they are. Don't take my man books. <laughs> take my man. God, They're all going, hey, hey. This, I'm better than your like, weapon on. Oh my yeah. God, that's funny. All right. Um, well, I mean, I can work on things from other media, I have discovered. Um, I can't work on short stories. Um, but I did um, the the Far Sector uh, comic book series scripts while I was working on, well, I was kind of in between books, but I was also still sort of developing the, the Great Cities books at that time. Um, but that's such a drastically different medium, prose versus script writing, I was able to do that. Um, and so I, I've discovered that when I'm crossing or when I'm, I'm crossing a media boundary, I can do it, but I can't do, and I can do fanfic. I can always do fanfic. I don't know why. Um, fanfic doesn't feel the same. It's like not pulling from the same creative track. I don't maybe know that that makes sense. Maybe there's the no pressure. pressure. There's no pressure, right? Uh, you can just, it can mm. just be there. Yeah, that might be it. And if, if I fuck up a fanfic, I'm not going to get like a bunch of bad reviews and end my career. Um, so it makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, no pressure, definitely. All right. Um, so there's that. All right. Next question. Uh, looks like the next one up is from Alisa or Alyssa. Uh, my apologies if I messed up your name. Um, history is full of stranger than fiction moments. Is there anything that stands out uh, as particularly expected or memorable during the course of your research? Oh, um, there is, but that would make, it would assume that I could think of it offhand. Um, can, can you, can you say something for five seconds while I think? Uh, 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 we're, 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 you know, I'm, I got no words. I'm sorry. It's the end of the day. Um. um, it's, yeah, there is. And I'm really sorry, but I can't think of them right now. Actually, most of history amazes me because mm -hmm. every time I read stuff, I think, oh, people did that. Oh, that person did that. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, history is a really useful guide to the idea that people both had very different ways of thinking about the world, but also mm -hmm. that they often reacted in ways exactly as we would have. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I know, mean, I know. I thought of what? one. What? I didn't know until some year, a few years ago when I really started digging into the Ptolemaic and Hellenistic stuff that Alexander had a half sister who was an older sister by Philip's first marriage to an Illyrian princess who was trained by her mother to fight and fought in battles. And I actually, had no idea. It, I know, I know, right? why are we not told this? It was completely, that. it's not that women commonly did that, but in the mm -hmm. Illyrian culture, that royal women did. So why weren't mm. we told that? Yeah. Right? Why don't we yeah. know about that? So. I, I think that's the thing that fascinates me the most about history is realizing what's been left out of history yeah. and realizing yeah. what's been completely fudged from horseshit. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, what gets hyped and what doesn't and why those things get hyped versus what, what doesn't. Um, that is fascinating to me. Um, you know, so there's Alexander the Great and there's Big Sister the Greater, basically. Um, well, well, we don't know her name, but... Um, or do Cyane, C-Y-N-A-N-N-E. C-Y-A-N-N-E, Cyane? C-Y-N-A-N-N-E. Is that would be the Latinized version Kainane. of it? I don't know what it is. Kainane. That's how okay. I say it. I don't know how it's really said. That's cool um, as hell. And All she right. trained her daughter. She trained her daughter to fight too. Okay, and, so and Kainane died in battle, and oh. the, the Macedonian soldiers were pissed because mm -hmm. she because that that she was killed. Even the ones fighting against her were because she was Philip's daughter. So she had that aura of the royal. So anyway, yeah, it's just history is far more interesting than that sad, yeah. bland yeah. tale we are generally told. Yeah, yeah. It, it becomes clearer to me the older I get how much of our reality is literally just rooted in the stories that we tell and how, that, how we tell them. And not so much the reality, um, but the interpretation of the reality. 
um, and and controlling those narratives ends up being uh, uh, the way that you structure a society. Um, yeah. Yes. Which is why we've seen all kinds of reactionary movements in popular media these days. But that's a different conversation. Yeah, but it but it actually gets back. So anyone who thinks, you know, I'm an artist, what matter? What does art matter? Art matters. Anybody that has gotten through this pandemic without binge watching stuff on Netflix or binge reading books or whatever, um, art has been getting us through this. And it's hilarious to me that, you know, as this this art has proven its importance, we've been seeing all these um, fascinating and exciting calls for art to be free and artists to not make any money. And that's a whole other conversation also. Anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's get to the other questions. All right, next up seems to be also from Alyssa. Um, We've got two questions with 10 upvotes. Why don't I take one from Natalie just uh, for for uh, complexity sake or, or bouncing around sake. Um, so from Natalie, we're gonna say, how do you make the leap from, this is an interesting topic I'd like to read about to I wanna write a story about this and we'll commit a lot of time and resources to it. That's an interesting question about the genesis of ideas and how creativity works. And I'm not sure I can explain it just, you get you get attacked, infatuated enough with it. Mm. I think a lot of it for me is in a form of infatuation. I just yeah. really get into it, and then I just really want to spend more time with it, and then that's yeah. where I go from. That's. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of a, what makes you an artist question um, in some yeah. ways, because like, what is it that, that makes your artist brain wake up and suddenly get interested? We don't know. Um, but I mean, that's the point where you know that you want to work on it, um, or at least for me. And it's interesting. Sometimes people ask, you know, what's a novel you read that you wish you'd written? Well, there isn't a novel that I didn't write that I wish I'd written. Yeah. I'm glad. I want them to write that novel. I couldn't have written that novel. Mm -hmm. I can write the novels that are I get excited about, and then mm -hmm. I get to read the stuff that other people did because their whole way of interacting with it is different than mine. Yeah. I and mean, specifically, I I've always written the stuff that I couldn't find. Um, I've always written the kinds of books that I wanted to read that I didn't see. Um, so, you know, I mean, that's my, that's what motivates me to actually do it is if I haven't read it already and I desperately need it. Um, yeah. All right. So let's see, we're, we're getting short on time, but I think we've got time for a few more questions. Um, let's go back. Let's to go down to what was the first scene or character that came ah. to you for the book? Cause that one's easy. Um, and I'm just going to say it. And then when you read it, you'll know the wedding banquet. Okay. Yeah, that's all I'm going to say. You're not going to give us any. Uh, no, no, no. It's the wedding. I will say this much. I that's basically a an almost exact ripoff from something that happened historically, only changed a little bit. But yeah. Okay. All right. Meany, but fine. But okay, we'll live. Um. So all right. Why don't we go? to a question. I see one from Emily Skrutsky. If I'm not mangling your name, my apologies if I am. Um, how do you handle managing world building and keeping trunk, keeping, wow, I'm reading too far ahead, and keeping track of a massive galaxy in a chunky absolute unit space opera series? You know, I did that by writing a seven volume epic fantasy trilogy from 19, <laughs> yeah, 1997 to 2006. Holy and I, while I did have a notebook of stuff, a lot of it was up here. I don't know. Now I try to write things down. I have a, uh, I have a, oh, let's move right here. Mm -hmm. I have this. With okay. Tools written in it, which I'm not going to show you. Mm -hmm. um, and some of it is to keep track of stuff and some of it is to make notes to myself. Mm. So I, I just, I use a notebook, analog notebook, cause that's, I'm a athlete. And so for me, the physical tactile and active moving is what mm. I need. Mm -hmm. I've experimented with different methods and I don't know how the hell you manage to keep a, a book series longer than three uh, in your head. Well, I don't um, do it I anymore, do I? <laughs> I see. 
Yeah, I was I was struggling by the time I got to the third book of The Broken Earth because it was the first time I'd ever done a series all the way through with one character. And like I had this little set of notes and they just kept getting bigger and bigger and it was, they were starting to turn into a book of their own and I just <sighs> Anyway, nothing but props for people that do long series. Uh nothing but respect. All right. Um I think we have time for one more question or do you want to do an outro? Which would you prefer? Uh, um, oh my, like, there's so many good know, questions. Whatever. Yeah, they uh, are good questions. Yeah, I'm going to say one thing to the person who asks, why did I choose the four points of view? Three mm. of them are in third person and one of them is in first person. Um, and that is deliberate. Mm. And there's a reason that that person's in first person, which if you know the history of Alexander the Great, you don't need to know it to enjoy the fact that it's in first person. But if you know the history of Alexander the Great and his court, and that Hellenistic history, you will be able to guess who that character represents is kind of an analog of. Okay. So that's just, I'm gonna leave that hanging um, because that's who I am. Look like okay. the cliffhanger. So. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> You're so cruel. Yeah, uh, I, 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 am, I look nice. I look nice, but I'm not. I know this. I will agree with this. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's a good, but it's a good, not nice. Um, I see there's a question for me uh, and it's a compound question. And I don't think we have time to answer that. But uh, uh, the question is, N.K. Jepson, where did you get the idea for emergency skin? The same place all my other ideas come from, the primordial id. Um, was that just based on wishful thinking? No, none of my novels are based on wishful thinking. I don't want to live in that shit. Um, I don't want to live in anything I write. Um, and, um, yeah, yeah. Not even that world, because that world went through some shit. Uh, and how do you make your novel so lighthearted and funny, yet so powerful and emotional at the same time? Uh, I need that to deal with the the heavy stuff. I need the the jokes to deal with the heavy stuff. That is how I am in real life, um, and that is how um, I tend to write as well. Um, all right, so we are at time. Um, this went faster than I was expecting. Wow. All right. Well, well there was a the whole excitement of my technical problems before it started. So yeah, but I mean, we started on time. Well, we did. Uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Well, all right. Well, all that said, um, it has been a joy and a delight as usual to talk with you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Nora. Yeah. We're going to have to do this more often, although the time yeah. zone thing makes it a little, a little different. Um, you're, you're in Hawaii and I'm in New York. So, um, but I guess we'll figure out some way to, to talk at some point in the future. All right. Well, um, thank you to the folks that have joined us. Um, thank you uh, for joining me for this. Uh, thank Technical Difficulty God for, for smiling upon um, our headsets um, and blessing yeah. our <laughs> Wi-Fi connections. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're going to go with that. All right. Um, I think we're done. So thank you. Bye. Thank you, Nora. Thank you. And thank you, everybody who came. Thank you so much. <laughs>